So then. If you awaken from this illusion, persistence of vision. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Persistence of Vision podcast. The podcast that asks why you are listening. <laughs> I love it. Why are you listening? <laughs> You're listening because we're here to inspire conversations, and we do so in every dimension of time and space. Hello, folks. I am Lance Fever Myers. Hello, folks. I'm L.B. Dio. This is Persistence of Vision podcast. Um, please go to our website, which is pov-publishing.com. There you can read... Uh, poetry, essays, and short stories, and all kinds of great stuff uh, by world-class artists and writers. You can see all the links to all, all our past podcasts and links to buy my book, Why So Much, by Lance Myers. And, and my book, The Goddamn Fool, by L.B. Dio. That's right. Please go do that right now. Pause, go buy our books, and then come back and listen to us talk about Tristram Shandy. Yes, and we're not only talking about Tristram Shandy, but we are talking to a former arts and entertainment editor and book reviewer for the Austin American Statesman, the great Jody Seaborn. What's up, Jody? Hey, thank you for having me on, and that is the life and opinion. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. I sit corrected. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, because the opinion part is very important. We shouldn't forget that. That's right. Right. Tell, okay, so tell us about why that's important. What the, so, well, okay, so this book is written in sort of first person, right? Like, right. Uh, uh, and, and it's all about this man, Tristram, Tristram Shandy, Shandy. Yeah. from his point of view. Right. And, uh, and what makes this book exceptional? Well, for me, um, I first read this book in college, so uh, 40 years ago. Seems odd to so say. So you were high. Seems, <laughs> seems odd to say that. And then I re-read uh, it uh, about 25 years ago. And um, I think that it is uh, often described as the first postmodern novel. It is, um, uh, there was a movie that came out about 15 years ago, Tristram Shandy, starring, uh, made by Michael Winterbottom and starring, starring uh, Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon. Yes. And in the film, uh, Steve Coogan is asked why Tristram Shandy, and, and he says, well, it, it's a postmodern novel, before there was a modern to be posted about. <laughs> yes. Pre-modern, post-modern. Yeah, Pre-modern, post-modern. And anyone who's read the novel, I think that that is their first impression. Is, mm -hmm. oh my God, this novel, which was written over the course of several years from 1759 to 1767, is so modern, so contemporary. It's meta, it's comic, it's satiric, it's everything that you would expect, something like uh, you know, a post-modern novel written... 20, 30 years ago to be. So that is uh, one of its main appeals for me. So postmodern, written in 1750... For, uh, it was written in a series of volumes uh, from 1759 to 1767. The first two volumes were self-published by Lawrence. We should say the author is yes. Lawrence Stern. Right. Lawrence Stern was a... Uh, you don't a, want to give him a swell head. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Lawrence Stern was a, a, a clergyman in Yorkshire. Um... You know, kind of a nobody uh, until this book was published, although the people in Yorkshire knew who he was. He had a reputation in Yorkshire. Um, and he wrote this, uh, the first two volumes in 1759, self-published them. Um, he pestered a publisher in London to take a look. The publisher in London took a look, decided to publish them, and it became an overnight sensation. And then he published uh, volumes... Three and four in 1761, volumes five and six in late 61, 1761. There was a lapse between volumes seven and eight. I think those came out in 1765. And then the last volume, volume nine, came out in 1767. And I should say that the volumes are fairly short. The book as a whole, when you put all the volumes together, is 500 pages roughly. So it's a manageable book, but that's its history. Wonderful. And so, this, oh, go ahead. I was going to ask, so, okay, so you, the first thing you've told us about this thing is that it's postmodern, right? So right. tell us what you mean by that. Why is that? Well, does anyone, why know, is what, that a does anyone know what postmodern is? <laughs> that's why I want to know. <laughs> I have no idea what postmodern is. Right. For me, the appeal is it's comic. It's, it's a very funny book. 
it's almost slapstick in portions. Um, it's uh, the life of Tristram Shandy, but we never really get through his life. When the book ends, uh, Tristram is only about five years old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although there's a segment uh, in volumes uh, seven and eight where it, there's a bit of a travel log that takes place when Tristram is an adult. But for the most part, the book... Um, most of the book occurs before Tristram's even born. Right, yeah. Uh, and the main characters are Tristram's father, Walter Shandy, and Uncle Toby, who is one of the finest characters in all of English literature. Uncle Toby is just a... a, a, a love Uncle Toby. Fantastic mm-hmm. character. Um, and so you've got these great characters, you've got these great situations that border on slapstick, and on some occasions even cross into slapstick. It's, um, it's satiric. It pokes fun at the novel, at the f- form. It's constantly comic, stern, or I should say Tristram Shandy, is constantly commenting on the novel. He's constantly commenting about how his struggles with writing the novel. Uh, it's digressive, but it's also progressive. He says at one point, I think in volume one, that... Dear reader, excuse my constant digressions, but bear with me because while it may appear I'm going off way over on this tangent and I'm circling back over here and I'm going backward and I'm going sideways, I'm actually all the time going forward. You will see. Bear with me. And indeed he is. It's constantly, as the novel digresses, it progresses. Hmm. Um, And um, it's very sentimental but not in a mawkish way. And it's, uh, I think most of all, it's a very forgiving novel. Hmm. Stern is constantly, explicitly, but mostly implicitly telling the reader to forbear with people around you. That we, we all have our eccentricities, we all have our quirks, and as long as those quirks aren't harming anyone, let them be and um, admire the passion behind them. And there certainly are some quirks in this book. Yes. Some very quirks. punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the book that this most reminded me of was, uh, was an even earlier novel, Don Quixote. Yes, very much influenced by Don Quixote. Yes. He, he references Cervantes throughout. Yeah. He references Cervantes. He references uh, Sa- Sancho Panza. He references uh, the horse, uh, Rosiante. Right. And, uh, yeah, they, they, they have that in common, though, don't they? That kind of postmodern, self-referential, uh, the, the, the dubious narrator. Or is that the word? The untrustworthy narrator? Yeah, you could say that because uh, if most of the events in the book are taking place before Tristram Shandy's even born, how does he know that any of this took, exactly. took place? Lawrence Stern is aware, or I keep saying Lawrence Stern, Tristram Shandy, the author, is aware of issue and he says early on oh yes I know that you're probably wondering how do I know all this well my uncle Toby Toby told me yeah but there are some events that even Toby Uncle Toby could have possibly known about so uh, yes. that's one of the conceits I think the novel one of the jokes that is constantly recurring so what do you think Drew draws this you to this book particularly I mean uh, out of all the books that you could have come on to discuss Obviously, you enjoy the book, you like the book, but what, what do you think makes it so important to you? Well, when you first asked if I wanted to be on this podcast and uh, what book I would discuss, I mentioned Moby Dick, but it had already been <laughs> <laughs> by our friend Mike Sands. Yes. Um, I would say that uh, if I had to say, you know, if someone asked me, what's, what's your Desert Island book? Mm-hmm. The one book you could take to a Desert Island, I think it would be Tristram Shandy. There's just so much to untangle. And you really, need, I admit that if you, you read this book, you do need to get a copy that has some good footnotes or, mm-hmm. or end notes because there are references that are kind of lost to modern uh, audiences. But you can put, put that aside and just focus on the main story. Throughout all the digressions and the side steps, there's this wonderful story about Uncle Toby. Um, and his wound that he suffers. Uncle Toby is a, a soldier 
yes. who was wounded in 1695, somewhere around there, during the siege of Namur in Flanders. The wound was in his groin. Yes, um, a, a grievous wound. A grievous <laughs> wound. And it took Uncle Toby three or four years to recover from the wound. Uh, and so the novel follows his kind of, and, and Toby is a very modest man. He's a very kind man. Unlike uh, Walter Shandy, Tristram's father, mm -hmm. he's an unpretentious man. And uh, he uh, follows his journey, and he becomes essential to his recovery from his wound is uh, he, he develops what Tristram calls a hobby horse. Yes. Which is a passion, uh, a hobby. And his manservant, uh, Corporal Trim, Trim served with uh, Uncle Toby in, in the British Army and was also wounded, yes. uh, but in the knee, so not nearly as... Although there's a part in the novel where they're, they're, they have an argument on which is the more grievous wound, <laughs> to be wounded in the knee or be wounded in the groin. <clears throat> I think most of us yeah, would agree. Most of us would have a pretty <laughs> um, straightforward uh, take on that. But uh, so it follows Toby, and he develops this at Trim's suggestion. He develops this passion on fortifications, mm -hmm. in order to learn exactly how he was wounded and where he was wounded. So on a bowling green, a, a strip of lawn behind Toby's house, he and Trim construct the fortifications of Namor. Uh, and so that Trim, so that Toby can locate exactly where he was wounded, and that becomes a joke at the end of the novel. Um, and then, as the novel progresses, Tristram keeps telling us that, uh, "Bear with me, dear reader. I'm getting to it, but very important to my book is the courtship of Uncle Toby with the widow Wadman." Yes. So eventually, we get to that, and that's near the end of the book. This um, courtship between Uncle Toby and the widow of Wadman, uh, which ends with this terrible misunderstanding <laughs> involving Uncle Toby's wound. <laughs> and uh, so he's, he's just this fantastic character. I think everyone who's read the book just comes away loving Uncle Toby. What do you think this book could tell us about the time and place that, that it was written? I mean, you guys both mentioned uh, um, Don Quixote, but also Jonathan Swift. Swift was right. uh, yes. a big, uh, you know, influence, and 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 I, c I can see some similarities in the takes, you know, in the right. um, the style and whatnot. So, what, what do you think? Well, that well, even the title is a play. It was very popular at the time in the 18th century with uh, British novels to have not to have a title, "The Adventures of" or "The mm, History sure. of." Um, so, um, like even Robinson Crusoe uh, by Daniel Defoe, I think it's real title, it's official title, it's something like The Surprising Adventures of yeah. Robinson Crusoe. Um, so yeah, you, you had this, the no, I guess we should mention that the novel at this point is really kind of coming into its own. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> and it's looked down upon by the educated elite as a form of entertainment mm -hmm. uh, for the masses. Um, but it already, by the time Lawrence Stern writes Tristram Shandy, it has developed certain, um, you know, it follows certain models, there are certain conceits, there are certain rules that are being developed. And Stern starts, po he pokes fun at those. Right. Um, uh, even in his title, it was again, like I said, it was very popular at the time to title your books the adventures of or the the life and history of, and by saying the life and opinions of, that's that's a poke at that conceit because really Stern is not that interested in writing the life of Tristram Shandy. <laughs> uh, he's interested in just kind of going off creating these sort of jokes and poking fun at everything that's in the air. And he keeps promising us, um, you know, the, underneath this cl clothing, this, this surface profundity, he keeps promising, promising us chapters on things like buttonholes and whiskers. 
but then never delivers. Mm. You know, that's part of the joke, too, of the novel. He promises all kinds of things throughout and then never delivers. I wonder if you would mind... I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> I wonder if you'd mind reading to us from the very beginning of the novel. I, I oh, yeah, yeah, we should say... a brilliant beginning. I love the beginning. We should say that, uh, yeah, the, it begins, the novel, one of the great openings uh, in British literature, the novel begins with Mr. Shandy and Mrs. Shandy uh, doing the deed. <laughs> and... Uh, Mr. Shandy is interrupted by Mrs. Shandy because he's in the habit of once a month on the first Sunday of the month, maybe it's the last Sunday of the month, I don't remember, of winding the clock, <laughs> the big clock in the hallway, and then going upstairs and doing his husbandly duties. Um, and so one Sunday when he's doing that, Mrs. Shandy in the middle of the act remembers, thinks to herself, I don't remember Walter winding the clock. <laughs> and, oh dear, did you wind the clock? And that interrupts things. And Tristram considers that the source of all of his life's woes and uh, issues that he's had in his <laughs> life. So yeah, I could read that. It's, it's a tr great beginning. Let me get to it. Oh, yes. While Jody finds his place, uh, I was just going to... Oh, okay, got it. Okay. Take it away, yes. I wish either my father or my mother, or indeed both of them, as they were in duty, both equally bound to it, had minded what they were about when they begot me. <laughs> had they duly considered how much depended upon what they were then doing, that not only the production of a rational being was concerned in, but that possibly the happy formulation and temperature of his body perhaps is genius in the very cast of his mind. And for aught they knew to the contrary, even the fortunes of his whole house might take their turn from the humors and dispositions which they were bent of the moment. Had they duly weighed and considered all this and proceeded accordingly, I am verily persuaded I should have made a quite different figure in the world that which the reader is likely to see. Believe me, good folks, this is not so inconsiderable a thing as many of you may think it. You have all, I dare say, heard of the animal spirits, as how they are transfused from father to son, etc., etc., and a great deal to that purpose. Well, you may take my word that nine parts in ten of a man's sense or his nonsense, his successes and miscarriages in this world depend upon their motions and activity, and the different tracks and trains you put them into. So that when they are once set a-going, whether right or wrong, it's just not a halfpenny matter. Away they go, fluttering like pago mad, and by treading the same steps over and over again, they presently make a road of it, as plain and as smooth as a garden wall, which, when they are once used to, the devil himself sometimes shall not be able to drive them off it. Pray, my dear, quoth my mother, have you not forgot to wind up the clock? <laughs> Good God, cried my father, making an exclamation, but taking care to moderate his voice at the same time. Did ever woman since the creation of the world interrupt a man with such a silly question? Pray, what was your father saying? Nothing. <laughs> Marvelous. Fantastic. Marvelous. Yes. So I think... <laughs> Coitus interruptus. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah, what I, I think uh, back to what I was talking about, and I think this this speaks to it. The um, the the works that have survived from that period as the touchstones for you know uh, literature and art and that sort of thing seem to to be very subversive. Mm -hmm. From this, you know, poking fun at at uh, you know um, conventions. Right. Uh, societal conventions well, in novel, particular. I said earlier, this novel was a huge hit. Uh, right, like yeah. Overnight sensation, but there were also those who considered it body. Mm, right. And indecent and heavily criticized it for its focus on... Well, there are these, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink throughout. Mm. Yeah. Uh, references to noses and uh, all kinds of things that could be interpreted as anything other than a nose. <laughs> in the novel, uh, uh, Tristan Shandy stops and tells the reader, um, you know, he's also
also Freudian. Before Freud. <laughs> because he tells the reader at some point, you know, all this stuff that I'm writing about noses, um, I mean noses. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes a nose is just a nose. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. not what you may think it is, dear reader. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to, to look back at that time period and realize that the, the there is so much body, uh, mm -hmm. even dirty content um, throughout a lot of literature, you know, from Chaucer to Shakespeare, oh. Swift, uh, Cervantes. I mean, they they were not Victorians. These were these were these were people who were living in a different period than. Right. Well, one of the big hits of about twenty years before Tristram Shandy was, was um, Samuel Richardson's Hamlet, mm. which was a big hit. It's a, an epistolary novel. It's this fifteen sixteen year old chambermaid or serving servant girl writing letters about her master. And now that I mentioned this, I hope I'm not confusing Pamela with Richardson's other novel, Clarissa. But there's a, a scene in I, Pamela where, as she's writing, her master puts his hand on her breast. Mm. So, because it's an epistolary novel, it means she is writing, oh my God, he's put his hand on her breast. <laughs> and uh, Henry Fielding, who wrote Tom Jones, um, is another one of my favorite books from this period. He wrote a parody of Pamela called Shamalos, mm -hmm. and it is uh, hilarious. It's a bunch of public players put by the hair bow, and then she mocks the hell out of you, and you're just a little doll. <laughs> uh, so it's within that climate that Stern is writing. Yes. Um, the, the characters throughout, and we've mentioned Walter Shandy, Tristan's father, and of course Uncle Toby, who's one of the great characters of all time. But there's also uh, Parson York mm -hmm. as one of the characters. Parson York is a uh, clergyman in the region. He's kind of the Lawrence Stern of the story. Uh -huh. And he's um, from Denmark. Right. And there's uh, Dr. Slump, who is <laughs> the yeah. uh, man, the man midwife. Uh -huh. uh, and Corporal Trim. Corporal Trim. Yes, sir. There's Obadiah, a servant, who's a bit player, uh, Susanna, a chambermaid. And so you've got these uh, really funny uh, second characters to who pop up. Yeah, you were saying that he that Stern was a uh, an obscure, I mean, not somewhat obscure, known in his district. Known, known in his area. And then the book comes out and is very successful. Right. His life is quite transformed by this. Right. He becomes a literary sensation. Stern also suffered from um, tuberculosis, mm. consumption, as they called it. In fact, that would kill him in 1768. He, um, the reason there was so much time went by between the fifth and sixth volume and the seventh and eighth volume is because he spent most of that time traveling around France and Italy trying to take the waters. Mm -hmm. relieve and um, out of those journeys, he not only produced kind of a travel parody that's part of Tristan Shandy, but he also wrote a book called The Sentimental mm -hmm. Journey that was published just a month or two before he died. And I've only dipped into his Sentimental Journey, so I can't say much about it, but uh, I know some people consider it also a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. writes about that period. It comes up occasionally in Tristan Shandy. Tristan writes about it first thus in the next line mm -hmm. of his late memoir. Yes. Yes. When reading about this, uh, I, I read a, a bit about the um, guy who trans, uh, translated this into Spanish, Javier Marias. And uh, he, he mentions having read the book. And I just love this bit about, because um, we've all had this experience, right? Whether it's with a novel or a, a, a musical composition or something. It was like, he said, uh, having read this, it taught me that anything can be in a novel. 
It's like really like sort of, you know, it's like I remember going to see Graham Reynolds play one time very early on and not realizing that that is the kind of thing that could be done with music. Right. And all those experiences where you're like, oh, this changes everything, you know? Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> right, right. You can do that with music. You can do that with a novel. Well, the big tragedies um, in Tristan's life that he writes about are really trivial in, in the end. There's the dispersal of the animal spirits, <laughs> the coitus interruptus. Um, <laughs> his nose is, and that's one reason why noses figure prominently throughout the book. His nose is crushed when Dr. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Dr. Forceps, which mm -hmm. were then kind of a new mm. thing. And there's a great argument between Mrs. Shandy and Walter Shandy. Uh, they have a prenup, what we would call a prenup, a marital arrangement, that if she were pregnant, she would get to lie in, as they call it in the book, in London. Mm. She had access to good doctors. Um, but there's a phrase or something in the marital agreement that if she has a false pregnancy or a pregnancy, or, you know, maybe a miscarriage or something, then the next pregnancy she has to lie in in the country. And so Tristram is that next pregnancy and by the marital agreement he's lying in the country. Well, Mrs. Shandy insists that they have a woman midwife, a midwife, who has a good reputation in the area, but Walter insisted on Dr. Slot. He's a man of education, <laughs> scientific advancement, and uh, they want him, he wants him to be present at the delivery. So it results in the crushing of Tristram's nose by the forceps. And then the other tragedy that occurs is the accidental circumcision of Tristram's <laughs> right. side. Right. Uh, when the window sash, uh, he's being watched by Susanna. Uh, he needs to pee. Susanna tells him just pee out the window, and as he's doing so, the window slash slams down. And mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's also the issue with his his name too, right? Well, that's right. Yes, and then there's the naming issue. Uh, his, his father, father um, insisted he wanted to name him Trismegistus. <laughs> not sure where that name comes from. To look it up. I think it was some uh, I think reference it was to it. Yeah, some uh, mythology or yeah, something. It has, it has some ancient classical. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, his father considered whatever you do, for God's sake, don't name him Tristram. <laughs> it is the worst <laughs> name. Um, so when uh, the time for naming uh, Tristram comes, Walter is lying. put on his breeches, but the naming needs to take place right then and there because they think Tristram is going to die. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, Walter tells <laughs> Susanna, all right, while I'm putting on my breeches, tell the parson um, that the name is Trismegistus. Yes. Can you do that? Can you do that? Yes, yes, I can do that. Well, she can't. She says, <laughs> the name is Tris something, Tris something. And the parson, oh, Tristram? Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, he gets this name, which Walter Shandy considers the worst name anyone can possibly have. Uh, and then to make up for it, um, Walter decides to educate Tristram by creating the Tristopedia, <laughs> uh, an encyclopedia of everything Walter Shandy knows about the world. You know what the Tristopedia reminds me of is the memory machine in the book 100 Years of Solitude. Do you remember that? The, uh, not really. I've read the book, but I don't really remember. There that. is a plague of insomnia in the book, 100 Years of Solitude, and in the, as a result of the plague, everyone just stays awake all the time, and, and no one feels the slightest bit tired, so they're quite comfortable not sleeping, except they all start to lose their memory. And so uh, one of the characters starts to make a memory machine, which is essentially like a book, uh, <laughs> that is everything that he can remember before he forgets it. And uh, it has filled with these wonderful little entries about, you know, these sort of uh, ludicrous descriptions of what various things are and what they mean. And they're always sl slightly cockeyed, but it's, it's great.
It reminds me of that. Yeah, there's, um, uh, you know, I didn't, as I reread this, I didn't stop and reread it, read every footnote or go check all the endnotes. So I can't say what is real and what isn't real from the Tristopedia or any of the right. sources. You know that some of them are made up, some of them are satiric takes on real events and are real people and real books, and some of them are sincere. And this is Which probably sure. not too long after the invention of the encyclopedia, right? I mean, yeah, Stern, I, I think, was a big fan of encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. like the Diderot yeah. encyclopedia, and yeah. Very interesting time in history, wasn't it? It was just uh, so much coming to be known and recorded and so much to make fun of. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I think, and I think that that's probably a part of why there's so much uh, scatological humor and and these kind of references. Yeah, in the 18th century, you do stumble across a lot of scatological humor in British in the novels from that period. And just and not just humor, but just references that we would we would be surprised to see nowadays. And I think that is probably as part of it is that they they live very close to that kind of thing. I mean, you. Famously, in London, if you walked down the street, you had to keep your eye on the sky because <laughs> someone might empty his chamber pot out the window right onto you. You know, it was a perfectly normal thing to do. But I think what's interesting, though, is the um, sort of philosophical, um, you know, air, the atmosphere of the time too, was that man was the pinnacle of creation. Yes. It was very. Uh, human-centric sort mm -hmm. of philosophical take on, on things, how, uh, you know, man is so fantastic and had this, like, very proper air about how, you know, fantastic we are as human beings, and we figured everything out by now, right? That uh, um, technology is, is making advances at the time, and we're starting to sort of elevate ourselves. Um, and then that, what kind of what uh, Jonathan Swift is getting at with the Gulliver's Travels bit, is it yeah, like pointing at... Pre-industrial revolution. Right. Just yeah, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's but the the societal, you know, it's like uh, the, the gentlemanly kind of, you know, we're uh, proper and we're, uh, you know, we're not animals, right? That we're different from that. Um, and the class divisions. I mean, you see, even though Toby is a kind, wonderful person, uh, Trim is always addressing him as if it pleases your honor. Mm -hmm. if I, if I, yeah, you know, right. May I speak? Right. And of course, Toby has no issue with. He's always happy to hear Trim speak, but there's in Trim, you know, the lower class, he's always, and it pleases your honor, if it pleases your honor. Sure, yes. But, I, you, but you mentioned the scatological um, humor, and I think that sort of that sort of flies in the face of, of the, you know, aristocracy in that sense. It's like, no, we're we're filthy, we are animals. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, it's... It's a religion at the time. It, it figures prominently in the book, the hmm. church. Right. And, and who has a soul and who doesn't have a soul. Yes. And Toby comes down on the side. Uh, there's a conversation near the end between, I think, Trim, Trim and Toby. Maybe it's Walter and Toby. Um, and Toby comes down on the side that everyone has a soul. Of course, we're all children of God. Mm -hmm. But uh, the person he's talking about is... Not sure about that, but maybe only... Good Englishman. Has right, soul. right. Which, you know, I think we can agree is probably the, the right position. Right? Uh, no, I, I side with Toby. <laughs> oh, you do? Well, <laughs> excuse me. I side with Toby on most things. <laughs> That's probably a good policy. Well, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, the sky is starting to get dark. I can see some uh, uh, flashes in the, on the horizon. It's like uh, lightning coming. Yeah, it's, 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 I, hate, I think I hear the sound of thunder rolling in. Are you ready for the lightning around, Jody? I guess so. <laughs> yes, that's Well, fine. before you take off, before you start going go to your hiding spot, I've got some questions for you. Okay. Rapid fire style. Well, like Tristram, I think it will be impossible for me to answer these rapid fire, but I will... <laughs> Without some di di digressions? I will endeavor to do so, good sir. <laughs> All right, fantastic. With your, with your worship's uh, permission. 
Okay, well, uh, number one then. Uh, tell us about the very first time you fell in love with a book. <laughs> you don't be, have to answer be, quickly. It would be the Childcraft um, collection of books. I don't know if you know what that I is. do, I do. I, that rings a big bell. I grew up in a house, we didn't have a lot of books around my parents, our readers. But um, for some reason, when I was five or six years old, my mom felt compelled to buy a set of world book encyclopedias mm -hmm. and the accompanying um, Childcraft. Ah. And I think that that's where I fell in love with it. That, you know, that's like one of those uh, time machine things. You, you mentioned child, Childcraft books with the World Book uh, set, and that just sent me way back. I, I loved those books. Volume 4 was the Make and Do book, and that was the one I liked because yeah. it had all kinds of crafts and stuff. The illustrations in those books were marvelous. It's yeah. Wonderful. I can still see the illustrations. Wow, Make and Do. Really? Like Stern. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, the... like, like Stern, I, I developed a love for encyclopedias. They had a big, beautiful section on the moon landing that I yeah. loved to read through. Space exploration. I think I traced those drawings yes. 20 times each. And the edition we had was published before the moon landing, so it was kind of still based, the, those drawings were based mm. on what they thought. Artist's impression. Artist's impression. You know who else was like that is the... The beautiful blonde woman in Doctor No. Do you remember he he encounters Ursula Andres on the beach, and uh, she says that she's never been among polite society or, or any society, never been to school, but she's been reading the Encyclopedia Britannica and she's up to T or something, and she says, "And I bet I know a lot more things than you do." <laughs> Man, childcraft. Okay, great answer. Uh, has a book ever changed your mind about anything? <laughs> I love it. Well, then, the, okay, so the bigger brother uh, uh, question um, after that is, uh, has a book ever changed your life? Yeah, I would say Tristram Shandy. Tr I, well, that's a good question because, uh, like, Tristram Shandy is one of those books that has stuck with me you know, for 40 years. So, obviously, it has affected my life in some way. Uh, but did it change it or did it just reinforce <laughs> pre-existing yeah. thoughts and assumptions? I, I, I would consider Tristram Shandy one of those books. Uh, Moby Dick is one of those books. I'm a big fan of Moby Dick. Uh, I like Tom Jones. I mentioned Tom Jones earlier. If I could, if I could jab my own bolt of lightning in here, uh, <laughs> can you tell us one of one or one or two of the the ideas you had that may or may not have been reinforced by this book, or else that you know views on the world that you that you. I, I think it's um, sort of an absurdity. Mm -hmm. I've always considered myself a bit of an absurdist, and so anything that has that touch of absurdism to it uh, usually appeals to me. Wonderful. Has a book ever made you cry? I am a cold, heartless bastard. <laughs> I don't cry anything. I'm as dead inside as dead can be. You and Graham Reynolds, he, he, yeah. he also wouldn't admit to, to shedding a tear over literature. I, I, I believe him. Is there, okay, uh, let me take this a step further. Is there a genre that you're more apt to cry over? Have, have you, you, mean have you a, I mean like. A medium? A medium, sure, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, a song, a, a film? Probably film. Film, yeah. okay. I'll, I'll tear up in the movies. All right. <laughs> cry, baby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, of course I try not to show it. Yeah, well, <laughs> too late. <laughs> Uh, tell us about a book that you have read more than once. Well, Tristan Shandy, um, uh, Thomas Hardy, I'm a big Thomas Hardy fan. In fact, I thought about it, and I think we discussed probably that might be a Hardy novel mm. similar to Tristan Shandy. Um, the Return of the Native, mm. Thomas Hardy's most famous novel, 
Okay. Then uh, uh, here comes the final question of our lightning round. Uh, the big one. Do you have any poetry committed to memory? Peace on earth. We sing it, and may a million priests bring it. After 2,000 years of mass, we've come as far as Casey Cass. Nice. Who's that, E.E. E. Cummings? That is uh, Thomas Hardy. Oh, Thomas Hardy. Look at that. The, um, I could probably, I don't know, pull couplets and snippets here and there, various poetry. Uh, this is that's a good short one. I like it. it. sums up Hardy is about as well as any. Mm-hmm. Brilliant, brilliant. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, this has been fun. Thanks for having me. Of course. It was, uh, that was a great conversation. Go out and read it, folks. Read the book. Read my book while you're at it called Why So Much by Lance Myers. Yeah, really. What are you waiting for? Why have you not read Why So Much? Why have you not read Tristram Shandy? Or The Goddamn Fool, for that Goddamn matter. Fool. Come on now. And if you don't want to read Tristram Shandy, check out Walter, um, Michael Winterbottom's movie of Tristram Shandy. Yes, and check out Michael Winterbottom's movie of Why So Much. <laughs> and The Goddamn, and the Goddamn Fool. Fool. Yeah, probably, probably coming out. Probably. You, are you still working on the audiobook? Are we going to have an audiobook yes, of the yes, goddamn the fool? Yes, the audiobook is, is in progress. I'm really, really looking forward to as the audiobook. You know. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, thanks for joining us. Thank also, you, Jody Seaborn. Yes, thank you, Jody, and thank you for listening, and thank you for checking out our website, which is pov-publishing.com. There you can see all the links to our former podcasts, and um, yeah, we'll see you there. And Bye. Please. Please, ladies and gentlemen, remember to wind the clock before you get started. <laughs>